This word in your ear is brought to you thanks to NordVPN. And VPN stands for what, Mark? Virtual Private Network. Say it again, Mark. Virtual Private Network. There and it what, is. And what is that, Mark? It's a way to keep your data safe on the internet whenever you're logging in, either at home or abroad. VPN protects your identity and encrypts your data so that nobody can steal your identity. And at the same time, this is the fun part. It enables you to access the internet via servers in more than 50, 50, count them, 50 <laughs> different countries. This means you can often sidestep regional restrictions and stream movies and TV programs from all over the world. I've actually been this morning, only, only just now, via Swedish Netflix. I've been watching Love and Anarchy. Have you seen Love and Anarchy? No, no. What's that? It's very good. It's a, it's a Swedish. I hesitate to call it a comedy. It's a little bit like Call My Agent, the French, uh, the French drama. You know, it's kind of um, it's a satire on modern manners, I suppose. And it's sent in a publishing house in the world of sensitivity readers and all the all the all the contemporary malaises that beset. Oh, you know, that's rich potential. Contemporary book publishing, and the thing that struck me uh, about it. And it's it's about a woman who's a consultant in to a publishing company and an affair she strikes up with a young IT worker. Um, what struck me about it is the parallels, bear with me a second, with the 19th century novel. And the 19th century novel, if you look at kind of, I don't know, Flaubert or you look at George Eliot or Jane Austen or all these people, it was all about, the fear of something going wrong in your life, the fear of disgrace. Yep. If anything slightly went wrong in your life, yes, shame would, on the family. You would be plunged into the abyss. And we are now, thanks to social media, back at that point. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody thinks they're just one bad tweet away yeah. from social oblivion, from ending their career. <laughs> a a absolutely. And so that's what Love and Anarchy is all about, you know. So I do recommend that. Anyway, that's just one of the many things that I've accessed via uh, NordVPN. And you can take advantage of a deal where you can try NordVPN by going to nordvpn.com slash your ear. Get it? Your ear. Or just use the code your ear to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free and a bonus gift. And it's risk-free because there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Full details below. <laughs> You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So we're gathered here to podcast on the day after what I'm calling a triumph, Mark, <laughs> our word in your park. It really was a triumph. It was lovely. Yeah, we had a lovely gathering at uh, Opera Holland Park under their, uh, on their, their tented arena. Gorgeous, lovely warm weather, um, well-stocked bars, just a load of uh, like-minded souls gathered together to talk about and think about and celebrate Paul McCartney. And I thought it was a delight. Four, we had four guests. We had Jeff Lloyd, the DJ broadcaster, who was just marvellous. Talked at great length about this radio show he did once with McCartney, where they just gave McCartney a series of musical instruments and said, see if you can get a tune out of that, which is incredible. And they give him a flugelhorn. And he can just, he can actually play a little tune on he it. He can do know? it. And they, they, they brought in this girl who I think she was the assistant pr pr producer who was a, a songwriter. And she'd written a song she wasn't very happy with. And she wanted McCartney to go spontaneously change the song, put in a middle eight or whatever, which he did. It was really, really interesting. And we had Andy Miller, the broadcaster and the co-host of uh, Backlisted Podcast, who, and we won't give it away, but wore a particular thing on stage which it's a, andy miller does paul mccartney cosplay let's you know let's yeah. not but let's let's just say like yeah, we, he was we dressed as mccartney we've done a we, significant day absolutely we've yeah, done things with andy before talking about the beatles where he's turned up in a magical mystery tour tank top well here he went one better one he, better really? absolutely brilliant he was and, so funny 
But uh, yeah, Danny was... Baker, Danny Baker, always wonderful. Just <laughs> oh my goodness me, just that extraordinary tangential way that he talks and thinks, and all sorts of uh, little sidelines explored. And he was kind of batting hard for the overlooked songs, wasn't he? Or the, or the underrated songs, or the dismissed songs like Frog Chorus. He was absolutely. Defending. And what I love about Danny is that he's got this commercial thing. And I remember this from the NME too, that there would be meetings at the NME and and Danny would go, and everyone was saying, should we have more crispy ambulance in the magazine? Should we have more, um, you know, uh, entire crew of the HMS Ark Royal, whatever the new band was. And Danny would go, (laughs) is anybody listening, actually listening to the radio? Is anybody (laughs) aware of what the, the, what the public are buying, you know? Yeah. And he was like that yesterday. We were talking about, um, we're talking about the great McCartney songs. And he said, well, obviously it was yesterday. And he talked about how extraordinary that was. You know, he acknowledged that. And then he talked about a song, which I'd never even heard of, called Kicked Around No More. Mm. And I got home last night and I had a look at it. on, And uh, it's on, on YouTube. It's just this wonderful thing that was a, a B-side, I think, on a single that he made in 1993. And just as good as anything. I mean, it's just really exceptional. You cannot believe that someone could produce things that knock out as a, D, as a B-side that are that good. So Danny's got every base covered, the most esoteric stuff and the most uh, and the most commercial. And the last person, Graham Goldman. Graham Goldman, he of 10 CC, he was good, wasn't he? He was fantastic. Got a ve- got a got a really remarkably warm welcome, didn't he? Yeah, people really did. people love Graham Goldman, yeah, don't they? they? Do. Yeah. People people are kind of they're uh, they're coming out about their love for 10 CC, aren't they? Finally, yeah. after so many years, you know. I know. Um, he was he was terrific. Of course, Graham was a kind of um, slightly younger, but kind of competing songwriter, member of a band in the northwest of uh, of England uh, at the time that the Beatles came through. So he, he was able to say that he remembered first reading about the Beatles in Mersey Beat that's magazine. Right. You know, so that, that's that's really going back. He was, um, and I loved his details. He talked about hearing things we said today. Paul McCartney song and listening to that was in A minor and suddenly it goes into the uh, me I'm just a lucky guy it goes into A major and he said A minor to A major I've never heard anyone do that before and immediately nicked the idea and I think he used it on No Milk Today by the Hollies I don't know which song he was talking about now but he just remember um, so how he would go through milk. and just just grab McCartney's signatures and appropriate them yeah. he said it's very funny he said with a very wry sideways he said I have been influenced by McCartney on occasions <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was yeah. really really funny so no, yeah good day. they were really all it was day. a great day and thank you very and then at the end we should say Magic Alex Gold turned up in his pepper jacket to serenade the crowd with one Paul McCartney song. Which you, uh, you, it, was, it was terrific. It was absolutely terrific. And we're not going to tell you what the song no. was. You know, that will remain a secret among the people, the, the few, the happy few, who are fortunate enough to be there. Thanks very much indeed to them for coming. And then, of course, as is traditional, we repaired to the pub, didn't we? And um, we did, we got quite lit up actually. Yeah, <laughs> the mitre in Holland Park. It was very good fun. Danny on, on superb form. Um, and just, Danny, uh, Danny was telling me, be, <clears throat> excuse me, be keeping an eye on the John Peel auction that had taken place this last week of various kind of um, premium price things from John Peel's personal collection that had been sold through the auctioneer's Bonhams. And which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And Danny was telling me that there was a set of um, of copies of Sniffing Glue, the the trailblazing fanzine that Danny was involved in doing. What they sold five copies, didn't they, or something like that? I think. Yeah, for I think it was twelve hundred quid. Twelve hundred. Yeah, and, and I, could, I just this really made me think. And of course, I said to Danny. Have you got any copies of Sniffing Glue? He said, "No, not not at all. You know, I, I never came to anything from those days." And um, you know, so he did it along with Mark P or whoever with the other people who did Sniffing Glue. Didn't keep anything at all, and yet they sent copies to John Peel at the time it came out, just wanting him to mention it on the air or whatever. And John Peel kept those. Those uh, uh, copies of Sniffing Glue, together with the letters that they sent to him, saying, you know, that here's our here's our venting. 
And I just thought that's extraordinary. When you consider how much stuff John Peel must have been sent over the years, and, you know, the amount of stuff you and I have been sent would only be a fraction of what had been sent to John Peel. And how often, Mark, have you ever kept a letter accompanying anything like Pretty that? Pretty rarely, actually. But Very the interesting thing about, about Peel is he'd done that from the very beginning, because I had a look, to the, uh, look at the thing, and it starts off with, I mean, there's a copy of Two Virgins autographed, which sold for £16,000. I thought that was very little, actually. Sorry, I just did. Uh, Captain Beefheart acetates a blind faith promo, a handwritten message from David Bowie, uh, plastic ono band test pressing. There was a postcard there was a postcard from Lennon, which was absolutely brilliant, where uh, Lennon talks about, uh, oh, here, here it is, I thought he says, uh, he says, uh, Dear John and Pig Peel, we're still alive and breathing in Los Angeles. Sorry about the monkey. We started to make a tape, but then the sun came out. Love, John and Yoko. Sold for £6,000. I thought that's very little, again, just so characterful and interesting. But he must have thought, now I can understand, a member of the Beatles sends you a postcard, you would keep that. But he kept very early pressings of groups that went on to be, you know, he kept, you know, Allman Brothers posters and things like that. Now, did he keep those because he, they were personal mementos? Or did he have the nows to think, actually, in years to come, who knows? These could be worth something. Or and if he... that's the case, did he do? Did he also? These are only groups that we know. It goes up to the Clash and Sex Pistols and U2 and people like that. There's a U2 single that sold for ten thousand pounds. But it, did he also keep, you know, Bog Shed and Fourteen <laughs> Iced Bears and Bomb Disneyland and all these? Stuff? I don't know because you know, I just and also where did he keep these days? I went to his house. I spent the night there once in his, his place in, uh, in, 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 in Suffolk. Suffolk, and, yeah. Yeah, and, it, you know, there wasn't that much. He must have had a warehouse somewhere. Where all this stuff was neatly labelled and assembled and kept. But he was obviously just a keeper, wasn't he? He was yeah. just one of life's keepers. He was that kind of anorak side of him. Never, it was always operating, even before there was a market for that kind of thing. Of course, the interesting thing, I was talking to Danny in the pub about all this, and Danny's theory is that the kind of um, the golden age for kind of boomer um, memorabilia is passing. Yeah. Because, you know, the people who remember it are dying. The, the sweet spot at the moment is punk rock. You know, so if you've got a signed damned, you know, acetates yeah, yeah, yeah. or whatever, that's the stuff that commands, uh, you know, serious sums of money. And then in a few years' time, it'll be, I don't know, the human league. Or it, will, it will just that's move right. on. And then it's going to be Oasis and it's going to be Blur. Yeah, yeah. You know. So it's all according to, you know, um, the, the, the band that the people in their 60s and 70s with a lot of disposable cash grew up with you know whoever they are so it's it's a constantly moving target you want to know who the people are who buy these things somebody paid 826 pounds for an oz obscenity trial vest and i think that's great would you would you then wear it or would you put it in a glass case and put it on your wall or would you put it in a museum or i don't know what would you do you hope to sell it on for more it's i'll let you into it i'll let you into a secret i'm wearing it right now <laughs> The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. Well, you and I uh, went out the, the other night and saw together, they saw the, the new Baz Luhrmann uh, Elvis film at the IMAX in, in Leicester Square, a sort of special screening, really, for people who uh, might spread the word. Um, and the place, in fact, that we saw the Get Back premiere back at, um, in, in wherever it was, in January. Um, I mean, it really worked. I mean, it really worked, I think, as a film, actually, but it worked seeing it in that fantastic, huge cinema. With that I would system. urge anybody who's thinking about going to see this film is, is go and see it. Go and see it in a cinema. Go and see it in the best cinema you can get access to. Yeah. On the biggest screen you can get access to because you know, it really suited the IMAX because it was the kind of dream, dream-like nature of the whole thing that you're – that the screen is so big that you know you're kind of you're looking one corner of it, and then you hear a noise up in the top corner, and you look up, and something else is occurring yeah. in the top corner. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, I tell you, the whole thing reminded me of. Do you remember years ago, you and I, in the days of Smash Hits in the early eighties, on the Smash Hits and Smash Hits yearbook or whatever, 
You used to do those comic book renditions yeah. of the story of the Human League or Shaking Stevens or whatever. Now, I know ours were very, very tongue-in-cheek, but it's the comic book nature of the way that the story was told in the, in the, Elvis, uh, the way the Elvis Presley story was told, which was, I think, so impressive about, about the Baz Luhrmann film, you know, that it, it went from kind of live action to kind of dream sequences to graphic devices to things that were actually from comics and kind of thought bubbles and all that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, they were, you know? yeah. And... Um, and so I just thought it was remarkably well done. And and I tell you what, I couldn't believe. I, I sat still. I, again, if you're in a comfy cinema, you, you sit still. Uh, and at the end, when the titles were rolling, I said to you, how how long was that? And you told me. And the yeah, answer I think was, it was about two hours, nearly two hours, 40 minutes. I mean, and I never suspected yeah. it was two hours, 40 minutes. I probably would have guessed two hours or something like that. Because you think, well, it's a, it's a big film. It's a big, big modern film. And, yeah. and they tend to, to be quite long. But I did not shift in my seat once. I didn't feel tempted to look at my watch. Once. No, and it was so, it's very, very, very supercharged. It was all about the tense emotional moments in his life, the sort of, uh, you know, the kind of tortuous agonies that he had to endure. There wasn't very much of him actually enjoying his, his position and his success. But what I thought was really interesting of a lot of things was that it, it kind of retold his story in a way that ticked every box for today's values. Absolutely. You know what I mean? You know, that, that you know, it, it was about him seeing the power of black evangelical music as a small boy, looking through the, the, yeah. the gap in a canvas and seeing a kind of evangelical gospel uh, service. Uh, it's about him hearing Arthur Crudup. You know, it's about him, uh, his relation with relationship with B.B. King and um, and Sister Rosetta Tharp and Little Richard and Mahalia Jackson and Big Mama Thornton. And it's seeing all those musicians, hearing those musicians and meeting a lot of those musicians, particularly Little Richard, is what makes him kind of appropriate, absorb all this black culture and these dance moves. And so it's presented as someone t- taking black culture and, and trying to kind of, uh, uh, as kind of self-expression and trying to win over a white audience. And so you get that and you get the fact that he's, he's, he's in, the real Elvis had absolutely no attention span at all, but he's incredibly good at concentrating and understanding and, 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 and fascinated by all the political events at the time, um, immensely respectful of women, occasionally gives them a little peck <laughs> on the cheek. <laughs> yes. And so and there's a, there's a scene where he, he's, he's organising his new sound and he goes around to the band and says, the bass player says, you play this, and the piano player, you play this, and I want the backing vocals to do this. You know. And actually, I think in real life, I mean, Elvis was a, a brilliant technician and a fantastic performer. But I mean, all that arrangement and choice of materials sort of tended to be done by other people, you know, yeah. you just yeah. turn up and play. So, you know, he comes out of it as this kind of tortured genius who who uh, was exploited, which is all true, the bit about the manager. I mean, Tom Hanks, also very convincing, I think it's Colonel, Colonel Parker, toad-like Parker, that he was kind of imprisoned by the fact that Parker had no passport and he couldn't go abroad and play. And when you think about it, my God, in the 1970s, he could have been doing these colossal world tours, couldn't he? At the time, yeah. everybody else was, and there he was, stuck in the... In Las Vegas, the, well, the, 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 the refrain thing, of caught in a trap came round. The, the, the odd, the odd thing about both Elvis and Colonel Tom Parker is they were actually both of them very small time. They didn't they didn't have a big vision, you know. That very often bands and the management have these grand visions. You know, we're we're going to be yeah. the first people to go to go to China or we're going to be the yeah. first people to do this or do that. He didn't have that at all. He's very parochial, very American, you know, very kind of heartland. Didn't want to get involved in anything that he couldn't utterly dominate. Um, you know, did not want to get out of his comfort zone at all. And, and when you compare that to the kind of the big stars of the 60s, they quite consciously got out their own company. Yeah, they did. Yeah. And so, you know, they, they kind of stretched themselves. New but, uh, but I tell you what's interesting is, it, you know, it, it made me think of Eam- Eamon Ford's book, Leaving the Building, um, which we talked to Eamon about a few months ago when it came out, which is about rock and roll estates, really, you know, about the, the planning for the, um, 
the perpetuation uh, of uh, of these these great legacies of huge huge names is that uh, this stuff doesn't happen by accident and so you know you keep the legacy of somebody like the beatles alive by doing a get back every yeah. 10 years or an anthology or whatever and and so this seems to me to be an attempt and a very successful event to kind of reposition Elvis Presley for a generation who don't really know who he was. No, completely. Because if you were 20 and you saw this film, you'd think he fits entirely with all my values. Is it, you know, it's like you said to me, is, I mean, he's, a, he's a woke Elvis, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, you, you can... You can perfectly approve of Elvis. He doesn't do anything in the film that you could not approve of, which is, which is not really the case. No, the no, not at all. all. I mean, you know, there were, there were whole areas of his life where he was just kind of this boorish old soak, drinking beer and eating hamburgers and loosing off pistols on his, on his ranch, you know. And uh, no, he appeared to be completely committed and completely uh, philanthropic. And uh, But listen, it's incredibly well done. Uh, yeah, I found it absolutely intoxicating. It's got a real drive to it. And, and the point you made earlier that it's very super supercharged, it is, but it didn't leave me feeling like those kind of supercharged superhero films tend to leave me feeling, which is I feel kind of tired. Yeah. <laughs> I've been battered by sensation. I didn't feel that at all with this. Is also the music is a combination of the original Elvis, the occasional one that Austin Butler, who plays Elvis, sings, and then the really artful deployment of kind of music, that, of, of a kind of hip-hop music or you know, yeah. contemporary music that, that kind of um, you know, weaves in elements of Elvis Presley. So it'll be, you know, if, you, if you're aware of uh, previous Baz Luhrmann projects like Moulin Rouge and Romeo and Juliet, you know, it's that kind of thing. And it's really, really well done. And you're won over completely, I think, by both of them. Because that's the thing with those biopics, is if you're not convinced that this is Elvis Presley, and Austin Butler, within, within seconds of him being on stage, huge build-up as to what he's going to look like. Uh, you know, episodes where he's shot from the back and you don't see his face. When you see him, somehow, instantly, the fact that he's completely mastered the choreography. There's a scene at the beginning where, where he discovers his kind of, the hip wiggling uh, uh, immensely excites the girls in the front row, which is absolutely riveting. And I thought he was roughly convincing. And Tom Hanks, I'm sorry, I love Tom Hanks, but Tom Hanks as the toad-like Parker was a, a, a brilliant turn. No, it's really worth it. Do you know what my favourite bit in it? I think it's in the Las Vegas where they have a sequence where he makes his way from the stage and he goes through the crowd of, of women in the 30s, yeah. his kind of original fans, and he kisses each one of them. Yes. <laughs> you know, he gives them a really deep kiss yeah. for about 15 seconds. With his wife watching. You know, <laughs> With his wife watching. And, of course, that's the thing that you have to understand about Elvis Presley, the thing that they always said about him. He was the greatest kisser in the world. <laughs> You're listening to The Word Podcast, where the time is whenever you want it to be. And now we're joined by our Patreon birthday boy, uh, Andrew Stocks. Hello, Andrew. Hello. Happy and birthday. Is it is it today, by any chance? No, it was the 16th, which was Thursday, wasn't it, I think? Today oh, is how was it, how day, is it celebrated? Uh, what did I do? I was at work all day in London, actually, so I didn't do very much. Um I went out for a meal with work afterwards. We did one of those dark restaurant things. You have been to one of those where you sit in the dark. Oh, you, you sit, sit in the it. dark. No, no, I've heard about them. What happens? Yeah, yeah. I, it was um, it was my idea, so it's all my fault, but it was um, it was quite quite an experience, really. Very freaked out because you literally can't see a hand in front of your face. I had this image that you'd be able to, you know, make out vague outlines, but nothing. I mean, complete blackness. And you sat there, you don't know what you're eating, um, and um, and you can't really even see you can't see how to eat. You end up eating with your fingers quite a lot because cutlery doesn't really work in that in that kind of environment. So when you get so, out, yeah. you find you've got soup stains on your tie. Is that kind of thing? yeah? I, well, you you're advised to tuck this quite large napkin into your into your shirt, which I did. But then when I came out, I had like yeah some some stains of something on my trousers when I came out. Yeah, I don't know what it was. But also wow. drinking wine is really difficult because you have to and they 
you have to pull your own. So you have to try and figure out how to do that coordination. How do you know where it is without <laughs> knocking it over then? Do you know, I'd never heard of this at all. It's Mark Allen, man of the world. Oh, no, I've is, heard of it. No, it's been going on a long I'd, time and I've quite I'd interested I've never it. heard of this. Because so one of the reasons where, people where do it is it, take place? it, it intensifies the the, the, the the sensation of eating and the flavour, doesn't it? Because you're concentrating entirely on the food. So where where yeah. was this? Where was this? It's um, Clerkenwell. All oh, right, okay. It I'm not a London be. expert, but Clarkwell, so near near Farrington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No yeah. Sure. So, um, um, and yeah. It, it's that dark that you can't see anything. Your hand in front of right, your face. Yeah, you have to you have to um, remove your phone and any smart watches you've got, anything that might light up. <coughs> so you're literally disconnected from the world in complete darkness. And there was a party of about it was work colleagues. It was about seven or eight of us that, that went. So it was really weird because, you know, you miss all that. You're talking, but you're missing half the the, the communication, the visual stuff. You... This is it. Absolutely. That's what they Absolutely. always say. What is it? 40% of uh, communication is non-verbal. Yeah. Then, again, <laughs> then again, 40% of statistics are just made up on the spot. That's very true. <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay, so in recognition of your birthday, Andrew, you've got okay. you've got something you'd like to throw into the word pot, a question for us to be pondering. What yeah, is- it's, well, it's been triggered by something that happened recently. So the question I wanted to ask was, um, are concerts getting longer or is it just me getting older? Where did okay. you go and see that, that made you think that? So I went to see, I took my daughter last weekend. No, not, yeah, last weekend to go see Billie Eilish at the O2 right, okay. in yeah. London. And we were, um, we arrived at... I think we arrived around about 7.30. Doors opened at 7. Yeah. <clears throat> Support Act was pretty much in full flow at that point already. So presumably really? been going for 15 yeah. minutes. And by the time Support Act was finished and um, uh, there'd been an intermission and then Billie Eilish had come on and then she finished and we got out, it was about half 11 at night. Yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. well, that's, that's over four hours. And Billie Eilish, oh, that's, you know, that no, is long. And no matter what you think of her, She's she's not got a huge oeuvre at this point in her career. You know, she's she's on a second album, done an EP, maybe. So how do you, how does that, that just didn't make any sense to me. So I think, what have we been doing for all this time? And, I, and then I thought, then I kind of went back a bit and thought, if this was a film, if this was a film being reviewed by, they'd be going, this is way too long and indulgent and, you know, rambling and stuff. And then, and then, the other thing that, that I'm going to show up in a minute and let you ask me a question, but the other thing that I started thinking about was, has that changed over time or or have they always been that long? And no, I, that I, has no, changed. They have, yeah, they? They weren't that has that definitely long. changed over time. Um, and, and I would have thought it's changed in response to the changing economics of the music business. So oh. basically... You're paying. How much did you pay for your tickets to Billy Irish the other it week? It was well, I upgraded. So as a story, so initially they were about eighty pounds, but then I upgraded <laughs> to. I looked at those and went, "Oh, I could do it being a bit closer." So it ended up being about one hundred and twenty pounds each. Okay, so, so two hundred forty. pounds. Yeah, but but but, yeah. but having having as everybody's making their money from 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 playing live, in order to justify those prices, yeah. which, which are the amounts they want, once you have. The band and the equipment, logistically sorted and on stage, it, it's 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 not actually going to cost you anymore to play an extra half hour. No, no. Uh, you know, you might as well keep going. I mean, I can understand why they're long if they're legacy bands. Like Paul McCartney currently plays forty-one songs, and that's fantastic wow. because that's what people want to see. And you don't want to support that; you want to see totally Paul McCartney. But I think it's a question of thinking: we can only make money by playing live. We've got to make sure that people think they're getting a good deal. Although I think four hours is really overdoing it, isn't it? God. I mean, I think so. I mean, I, it's interesting you talk about Paul McCartney because I was looking for a direct comparison. And um, when we spoke last time, we talked about, because I live in Lincoln, and the Beatles came to Lincoln once. It was um, November 1963, just mm-hmm. on the cusp of <clears throat> with the Beatles being released. And they did, their set in 1963 was 26 minutes long. Yes. So, so you could fit maybe two of your podcasts, so two of those into one of your podcasts, basically. Yes. I, the first gig I ever went to, proper gig, uh, was uh, to see Chuck Berry at the Bradford Alhambra. I think it was the Alhambra. And this would be 64, or yeah, it would be 64, I think. And so reading from the bottom of the bill, 
the Nashville teens, the animals, Carl Perkins, King Size Taylor and the Dominoes, and then Chuck Berry. Okay. And they did two shows every night. So that was like the six, six o'clock show, which would all be done and dusted by eight o'clock. And you and you'd be moved out, and then they bring in the evening people as well. So there were there were not feats of endurance. <laughs> No, those, those gigs. How you know. long was that whole show then, Dave? Well, the entire show would probably be ninety minutes. I would yeah. have thought like that, you know. And you'd have a compare in between doing gags and so forth, you know. Um, in while they I were miss that shifting kind of the bands, I love it. I love the idea. Well, you that can't you just, do that kind well, of the thing. The enemy poll winners, people would just come on, they just play two or three songs, and then they'd be off, and on would come the Stones or whatever, you know. They'd do the same. And it thing. can't, it, it can't be done anymore. You no, know, it's too. Expensive. So if you're charging eighty pounds, hundred pounds, whatever, you've got to entertain people to death. Really, yeah. to to justify the sums of money, you know, and also the other thing, I don't know how much of this applied to Billy Eilish, but the spectacle, the kind of mechanics of spectacle, are a huge part of music presentation nowadays, aren't they? There will usually be some kind of stunt, something will yeah. something will explode, or something will fly <laughs> off into the into the into space, you know. Kind of stuff that Earth, Wind, and Fire used to do back in the day. Everybody has to do now. Yes, they now want people to film and tweet. You know. Well, because yeah. that's how people interrogate their value for money. When they go away, you know, from he- enormo gig, and they don't say, "Do you know I felt he played? I felt he played the middle eight with particular sensitivity there." <laughs> I felt so moved. Said, we like, had fireworks. We, we had, had pyros. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All those kind of things. So what do your daughter think of it? She loved it. I mean, it was her first big Enormo concert, really, in a big arena like that. She'd seen people before in smaller venues. So, so yeah, she was um, she was, she was, was very tired by the end of it. She'd done a lot. Of I was going to say, she must have yeah. been, she must yeah, been tired. She, yeah, she, she's four, 14 now. So it really was four hours, you're saying? Yeah, four hours. Four With hours a break? There. So she wasn't she wasn't bored because no. normally if you take I know she's not a small child but if you take a small a small boy very often do you take them to football and they they want to go to football they desperately want to go to football and then after a while they think is it over it should be over by now you know because right. they, yeah. they're so attuned to highlights <laughs> you know? um, and but she wasn't like that at no, all she, she wasn't didn't. bored at all no because there's a, there's a, there's also a spectacle isn't there a little bit when you sit in a huge arena. And you can see, I mean, and it's a huge one, you know, too. You just see all the people around. She'd never been anywhere where with that, that many people. people. Yeah, 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 yeah. So even that in itself was a was a thing. Yeah. But I I wondered whether it was like um, you were talking about the Chuck Berry bill. So I wondered whether it was like a hangover from the old days of music hall variety, where you you know you would go, you paid to go and see a show, and you might only want to see one or two people on that bill. But it was a bill. It was an evening's entertainment, and. So it was lots of different, lots of, you know, bite size, they'd say nowadays, kind of pieces of entertainment to keep it going. And whether the early, whether the early music concerts were like a hangover from music hall. Effectively, well, yeah, like they probably that. were. It's interesting you should say this, because I've just been reading a really excellent biography of Bob Hope. And of course, he started in vaudeville, you know, and vaudeville was the kind of American equivalent musical, really. And, you know, they would... They would have a show. Vaudeville shows would would turn about four times in a day, and there very often be three acts, and so they would open with a non-verbal act, very often acrobats or whatever, because people were coming in to find their seats, and you, therefore you didn't you didn't want anything that could be ruined by people coming in front of you or whatever, and then the headliner would come next. And then the the third act would be what they called a clearer. So basically, the job of the third act was to make Get sure nobody people. hung about. So what kind of act was a clearer? Well, just not quite as hot as the headliner. And it's really interesting because it was only when reading this, I realized I suddenly saw the stands in all those old Fillmore East and Fillmore West bills from the late 60s, early 70s. It's run by Bill Graham. And so you, you'd look at these bills and you think, well, the biggest act was the Onward Brothers, but they weren't even the headliner. Well, the reason was that they, they were the they were meat in the middle. 
and they, you know they 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 they, they would be kind of Pete Brown's battered ornaments would come after them on the basis that people would leave then because they, they wanted them to leave. So how would you feel if you got the top slot and you were fully aware that you were the clearer? <laughs> well, no, I think you would be. You would be aware of it, you know, according to the um, according to how much you were paid. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, that um, it, that that's my experience that it went back. It goes back to, you know, uh, package tours, and then now what you've got now is the absolute opposite of this. People don't want support acts, all the kind of thing. Will it ever go back in any way? I, I don't know. I can't. I can't see it at the moment. Can you? Well, on the, on the economics front, you were t- you were you were saying you know because obviously you got all those costs to recoup, but you did Chuck Berry did he do did you do a matinee? Did you do two performances on that evening? Did he feel? Yeah, that that's my point. He did. I went to six o'clock yeah. show, and then there would be another one at eight o'clock. But he wasn't particularly taxing, you know. Right. <laughs> he was only on stage for twenty five minutes or something like that, you know. He talked about the Beatles earlier. He, even the Beatles at Shea Stadium. They only played for half an hour. They played they? for half an hour, but then been the, the whole day had been about five or six support acts, hadn't it? So, yeah, you know, people yeah. Would, they, people would have peaked. They just they couldn't have dealt with any more. That's all they wanted, really. But Mark, I, I have to tell you, Mark he used to have the best, most efficient way of gig going ever. I'll tell you about this. This is years ago. Mark lives in in West London, and so one of his nearest venues is the Shepherds of Bush Empire. You know the old BBC. Yeah, Hamilton's Odeon and all that. Right, yeah, and um, and he used to, when he knew somebody was playing, he wanted to see. He would find out when they were starting, and then you'd go on your bike, wouldn't you, yeah. Mark? Round to the Shepherds of Bush Empire, park your bike. Get in there about 10 minutes after they'd started. Is that right? I'm afraid this is true. I yeah, think used to go with my youngest son. We just go and we just see three or four songs. And they just leave. And then go home. <laughs> I can remember doing with craft work, sending the PR as a, as a mate of mine. I said, what time are they going to play Computer Love and the model? And he said, oh, well, I can tell you, I've got the set list. They're yes. playing at Brilliant. 9.40. I can remember we just turned up, we saw Computer Love and the model, and went home again. Yeah. <laughs> it was terrible, really. But, uh, but that's because you, you hadn't paid on that occasion. No, I hadn't paid, but actually, Where's really, that? that's all the craft work I particularly wanted. No, absolutely. But if you've paid 80 or 100 pounds to see craft work, you've got it. You've, you've got to got suffer to all the way through, money. haven't you? You really, yeah. you yeah. know. Yeah. But, and, I'm, but I'm, with, I'm with you on that, actually. I mean, I was... For Billy Eilish, there are only probably three songs I wanted to hear, really, of, out of the, the whole four hours of, of sitting there for it. And 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 the way that she constructed the set list, did she have them at either end? So <laughs> I had no of choice, course. really. But Billy Eilish is only twenty years old, isn't she? So yeah. how how is she? Sorry, I mean, what, is she playing lots of covers? I mean, where does this no, like four hours no, material no come covers, from? No, there was just she it was all. Do. They're all very long and, you know, things were drawn out past their recording. Massively extended yeah. versions of, yeah. of yeah. other so, records. Yeah, I say she's only got two albums and an EP of material. So <laughs> so, so let, me, let, me have a, let me have a picture of you and your daughter. So you're sitting next to each other, presumably. Yes. And so yes. she's up and dancing and absolutely yes. loving it. And yes. you're just... You're just I'm checking there. my watch. <laughs> you got it's your headphones on. you got your headphones on. You're listening to Half Man, Half Biscuit. I don't a think really I've copy done. of Private Eye. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> but there were there were other. I would say there were other men of my age in, in in our area with you know teenage daughters, and I was looking at them, and they were doing similar. But actually, they they went to the bar quite a lot. They were right. you know, they'd do ten minutes, then they go to the bar, then they'd come back, and I stayed for the whole thing. But yeah, I was checking with the time quite. A I bit. remember I once I went when my. Eldest daughter, one was she was a big, very keen on the Backstreet Boys years ago, and I took her to see the Backstreet Boys at Wembley Arena, and I'm sure I remember that Wembley Arena used to have a kind of lounge upstairs where you could go and you sit there, you could have a drink and certainly have a cup of coffee or whatever with other parents, and you could look through it through a screen into the <laughs> hall. Where like you're at a swimming pool, a swimming pool, well, a so, gallery. which I thought that's a really civilized idea. You know, you're there, you know, keeping tabs, you get some idea of what it's like. They have exactly the same thing in Shepherd's Bush Empire, they have a TV screen. It's, you don't look directly into the venue, but you know, so dads and mums can, can sit, sit at the bar and just keep an eye on it on the telly so they're aware <laughs> of what's going on and see if their son or daughter is stage diving or whatever. Yeah, but yeah. otherwise, they actually have to be in there, they could turn the volume down. It's yeah, very civilized. Well, yeah, well, 
Oh, well, look, thanks, Andrew, for uh, for raising that. It's an important issue. It is. And, uh, you know, we, we shall see. We shall see what happens in the fullness of time. The Word Podcast. Clearly, there is no plan. <laughs> That's this is the sound. This mm. is the sound of somebody Me. eating. I'm eating Keith Adsley's fava beans, or indeed fava beans. How do you pronounce them? I believe it's father. Father. I think it's father. So we're eating Keith father's fava beans on Father's Day, aren't we? It is. We are. Isn't it? Father's Day. Keith Adsley, um, Patreon supporter of this parish, is involved with a company called Eat Whole Foods. And um, he gave us some of his sea salt and cider vinegar roasted fava beans. And we rather like them, don't we, Mark? They're really fantastic. <laughs> They're really I think good. we're going to encourage this. This is proper product placement. But It is. If anybody wants to send us. No, in any Patreon supporters, Mark. Patreon this is any send. Patreon supporters. If you're a Patreon supporter and you happen to run a commercial enterprise, preferably involving comestibles. Involving pies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Drink, or drink booze. is also good. <laughs> um, beans, anything we can eat and consume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Send it to us, and we'll we'll actually mention you, won't we, on the pod? We will. It's, it, it's you know special. So I'll mention Keith Adsley, for, very for, for Patreon supporters. That's Eat Whole Foods um, to be found to be found in St Albans Market, I believe. Is That's is, right. is is regular pitch. But no doubt available online. I don't know. Can't investigate. So, any other business, Alex? Is there anything we ought to be um, keeping people abreast of? Uh, well, no. we have a handful of new patrons, actually. Oh, oh go good. on. Uh, Excellent. You know who they are. They are uh, Craig Mason. Good. Hello, Craig. Craig. Welcome aboard. Yes. Andrew David Nelson. Andrew David Nelson. Why, why so formal? Go on. And okay. David Wardropper. David Wardropper, what a fine name. That's a excellent. Superb name. And uh, well, it's always good to have you on board. And if you know, and if you haven't considered being a Patreon supporter, why don't you go and look into it? I just go to patreon.com slash word in your ear and find out the various different ways that you could be involved. What have we uh, what have we posted in the last few days, Alex? Um, we did our chat with uh Paul, Paul Gorman. Gorman about about the um, Barney strange, Bubbles, world, strange world of Barney. That was very very interesting. If we dug yeah. out all our old Barney Bubbles uh, see uh, album sleeves, that was that was terrific. I thought very good. Uh, Barney Sharon will be yeah, out Bob soon, Bob wouldn't it? Barney Sharon has written a memoir about yep. her life as a, a rock journalist and a, and a, and a PR. Um, yeah. I think that's probably it. Was it Mark Petras? We talked. We we, Mark we, we put that. Mark Petras. Mark Petras. Wonderful thing about glam rock. Beautiful yeah. book. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, I, I just had a hard copy of that has arrived. It's absolutely a gorgeous thing. It's like an annual, Design. isn't it? It's like yeah, it's like just, a, it's like a Christmas book that you might have got given me you know, back in the day. It's, it's really good. All the pictures, the photo research, the ephemera, the little odds and ends. It's just, it's really exciting. Makes you feel very fond about that entire era. It's great. So we go. We got loads of stuff coming up, you know, in the near future. And listen, it was terrific yesterday to to bump into so many uh, members of the word massive, wasn't it? It was. Uh, yeah. uh, great to people, talk to them. People had come a long way, and um, and you know, it's quite touching to be told, you know, how how much they they listen to these things and uh, and miss them if they're not there for any reason. Well, fear not. We'll be there. <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by The Word. 